Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to Brookings. I'm Norman Eisen, and I'm a senior fellow in governance studies here. Uh, today's event is a discussion of the Democracy Playbook Project, a collaboration uh, between governance studies and foreign policy here at the Brookings Institution and the Transatlantic Democracy Working Group, which I co-chair. We are a bipartisan coalition of former government officials, scholars, and experts, and uh, we are headquartered at GMF. Uh, I want to thank the president of Brookings, John Allen, and the Vice President and Director of Governance Studies, Daryl West, for their support of this program. Uh, my co-chair uh, of the uh, bipartisan TDWG, uh, representing the conservative side of the aisle, Jeff Gedman, uh, and uh, the President of GMF, Karen Donfried, uh, all my colleagues here, uh, Letty Davalos, who helped put this event together, and my wonderful co-authors who you'll be hearing from today, uh, Tori Tossig, Alina Polyakova, and Susan Cork. Um, you'll meet them a little later, as well as our, our other co-author, uh, Andrew Keneally, who couldn't be with us today, but is joining us over the internet. Good morning, Andrew. Uh, speaking of the internet, hashtag democracy playbook to tag this uh, on Twitter or other social media. And uh, we welcome uh, our uh, audience of hundreds of folks who have logged in online to be with us uh, virtually. Uh, we have a special guest to kick off uh, today's conversation, and that is uh, Senator Ben Cardin of Maryland, who will deliver keynote remarks. Uh, we're thrilled uh, to have you with us, Senator. Um, you are a champion of democracy, working for years in the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. The Senator is deeply committed to working across the aisle uh, in the spirit of all the institutions who are involved in uh, putting together today's event, putting principles and people first uh, he is the ranking Senate commissioner on the bipartisan U.S. Helsinki Commission, needed today uh, more than ever. Uh, since 2015, he served as the special representative on anti-Semitism, racism, and intolerance for the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly. Uh, the senator is an outspoken champion of human rights, and throughout his career in public service has advocated for accountability and transparency measures, two things very near and dear to me, to promote good governance and to combat corruption. Uh, some of his recent work includes introducing bipartisan legislation to track, analyze, and report corruption in foreign lands, the Sergei Magnitsky Human Rights Accountability Act that imposes sanctions on Russian individuals and entities who commit gross violations of human rights against rights defenders, and the Global Magnitsky Act, a law that the senator co-authored with Senator John McCain that gives pro-democracy actors a powerful tool to push back on authoritarian, kleptocratic governments. The Magnitsky Act and the Global Magnitsky Act, as the many experts I see gathered around the room here today know, are two of the most signature pieces of legislation in the United States and around the world for defending these values that we hold so dear. Uh, with all of these demonstrated commitments to bolstering democracy and human rights across the planet, uh, the rest of which uh, are too numerous uh, to list, we are deeply honored to have Senator Cardin as our keynote speaker here today. Senator. Ambassador Eisen, thank you very much for that very generous introduction. It really is a pleasure to be here. Uh, I would accept any invitation to get off Capitol Hill these days, so thank you very much. Uh, I got the Democracy Playbook about two minutes ago. I have not read the full report. In fact, I have not read any of the report yet. 
but I'm looking forward to it. So thank you very much for your contribution here to democracy. Uh, I'm going to be very serious this morning because I am extremely concerned about the status of democracy globally. And I thank Brookings for sponsoring this event, and I thank you for the team that put together this playbook, because we need you. Democratic states desperately need a, a, a game plan to counter what's happening globally and here in the United States. Uh, let me just start, if I might, by a, a trip that I took uh, with uh, uh, the majority leader of the House of Representatives, Congressman Hoyer, under the auspices of the Helsinki Commission, uh, we went uh, to Europe in July uh, for the Parliamentary Assembly meeting in Luxembourg. But before doing that, we decided that we wanted to go to Budapest, to Hungary, to see firsthand what was happening in that country. Uh, we knew that there were troubles in the country, but we wanted to, to see firsthand what was happening in, in, in that state. And um, as I was talking a little bit earlier uh, to the panelists, as I was listening, I met with half a dozen government officials from all different agencies. And as I was listening to their response to our concerns about the freedom of the press, about imprisoning opposition, about removing democratic principles of one party state and uh, revising history, I thought I was in China. And I say that because when I was in China, every official I met with gave me the same response to every question I gave, answered. It was talking points given to them by their government that they were required to respond to whatever we said. And that's what I found in Budapest. Every one of the government officials gave us information that was factually wrong about the control of the press by the oligarchs that Mr. Orban has been able to control the message going out, gave us misinformation about the revisionists of history as what they've done in Hungary's uh, involvement uh, in World War II. Uh, they gave us revisionist history on the protection of civil societies. And every one of these issues was just uh, frightening to hear. Uh, Hungary, which is a NATO ally, a NATO ally, is no longer a democratic state according to the principles of the founding of the NATO alliance. The NATO alliance states very clearly, founded in 1949, on the principles of democracy, individual liberty, and rule of law. Hungary doesn't meet those standards today under President Orban. And what makes matters even more frightening is that we visited the Aurora Center the Aurora Center is a, a, a nonprofit uh, protection for civil societies, a place where the NGOs can come and meet and share information and talk about events and try to organize uh, it to, to, to protect democratic principles. And uh, we, we met there at their request, and they told us that because this meeting was taking place, there were certainly going to be repercussions to the center itself. They had lost their license at times by the government officials because of their protests. They had been harassed. Their funding had been cut off. Uh, a lot of things. And sure enough, just about a month ago, a couple weeks ago, a group of, of, of criminal types broke into their offices, uh, harassed uh, their, uh, physically harassed uh, their people there, and the government made no response at all to these attacks. Uh, that's what's happening. Hungary, of course, has adopted uh, the, um, uh, just recently the uh, foreign agents law, 2017, very similar to the Russian foreign agent law that uh, puts a very chilling effect on civil society's ability to operate. Uh, Hungary is moving further and further away from the principles of democracy. They're moving in the wrong way. So it, it, it gave us the, the stark reality that uh, of the popular misconception that democracy arcs upwards forever. It's not inevitable. We don't necessarily are able to protect democratic states just because it's the right form of government. Now, Turkey's not, uh, Hungary's not alone. Another NATO partner is even worse, Turkey. Um, <laughs> Every day you're reading more and more things that are happening in, in, in Turkey. Uh, it is a, a country that um, 
Again, we were formed, NATO, to protect us from the threats of the spread of the Soviet Union, of their, of their national security threat against us. And what does Turkey do? They buy the S-400 from Russia. Compromising our national security and the security of NATO and sharing military information with our adversary. And make no mistake about it, Russia is our adversary. They attacked our country in 2016, uh, and they continue to compromise Americans' national security interests. And Turkey now has a military relationship with Turkey, which is with uh, Russia, which is prohibited under the NATO alliance, and by the way, also uh, triggers uh, sanctions under the Katsa statute. But Turkey has done a lot more. They invaded Syria. We all know that. How tragic this is. It compromises our ability to fight counterterrorism, to, to have counterterrorism in that region. Our, great, our, our, our ground forces are the, Turkish fight, are the Kurdish fighters. And the Kurdish fighters now have been very much compromised because of the Turkey intervention uh, into Syria. It is the world leader uh, in jailing journalists, Turkey. 180 media outlets have been closed. 220,000 websites have been blocked in Turkey. Uh, under uh, Erdogan, we've seen the use of emergency powers rewriting the Constitution, imprisoning those who challenge the power, undermining judicial independence, violating the rule of law and civil liberties, uh, and the list goes on and on and on and on. Uh, it was uh, Brookings that sponsored, and the German Marshall Fund that sponsored, how do the liberal uh, leaders who gain power operate to keep power? What is the game plan here? And we've seen this over and over again, and you can just take a look at what's done, what happened in Hungary and Turkey to see this play out. Once they gain power, they end the independent judicial review. That has happened in both of those countries. They create a one-party state. Both are now one-party states. They attack the independent media and civil society, controlling the message to the population to gain support. And they cast those who oppose the ruling government as out-of-touch elites, as globalists or bureaucrats, and increasingly identifying them as enemies of the state. And we've seen this happen now with two of our NATO allies. And the list goes on and on and on. If these practices sound familiar and too close to home, they are too close to home. We see a growing presence in our own country supporting these types of practices, promoting nationalism and anti-migrant sentiments in order to get popular support, uh, giving legitimacy to those who promote hate, the misuse of executive power here in the United States. Uh, please look at how the Trump administration is using the power uh, and abusing the Constitution of the United States. We could talk about the Emolument Clause, but th that'll be for another day. Congress specifically took action in regards to our southern border, and the president used the power of his office to negate the actions of Congress. To me, it's clearly unconstitutional and illegal, but it's not the first time. The president's trying to take over the powers of the judicial branch. Look at his appointments. And the Senate are not standing up to those appointments. We're not giving independent review. He's trying to take over the courts. Look how he criticizes judicial decisions. And the media, which he calls the enemy of the state, trying to compromise independent media. And then we see the president intentionally misstating the facts in order to try to control public opinion through his tweets and social media. Uh, these are signs that we see in, uh, in societies that are moving away from democracy and justifying control by one party. We do need a democratic playbook, so thank you. We need this. And you're going to hear from the panelists a lot of the principles, and I have not had a chance yet to, to, to re review this report, but we do need to have this game plan. Let me just give you a few of my lists of things that we need to do in order to protect democracy. 
We have to be able and use uh, sanctions against those who violate basic human rights. I thank Norm for mentioning the Magnitsky statutes that I worked with Senator, late Senator McCain on. Uh, believe me, these sanctions work when you deny human rights violators access to our banking system or to this country, it hits them where it hurts because they, they don't want their money and their local currency, and they certainly like to visit and have family here in the United States. And now with global Magnitsky and also the first Magnitsky statute, we're getting cooperation of other states around the country, around the world. So Europe is following suit, Canada has followed suit. So we are getting a more global response to human rights violators. It needs to be used. Senator Wicker and I have introduced legislation that would impose these types of sanctions in regards uh, to Turkey and their most recent violations of basic human rights. Uh, we also have the Katza statute that I mentioned earlier that is mandatory sanctions against Turkey in regards to their purchase of the S-400. Uh, we need to develop uh, a, a stronger tool against corruption. And, and Vassner Eisen has been one of the real champions on behalf of anti-corruption. He's done a great service, uh, and I, I applaud him, his efforts in that regard. The legislation he's referring to would establish an uh, a, a review of every country in the world like we do in trafficking in persons with tier ratings. No country is perfect, but there are standards that countries must have, including independent judiciary and, and having anti-bribery laws and, and, uh, those and having uh, bureaucracies that are, are not, uh, don't receive bribes and how their public con uh, contracting is done. There are, there are standards for how you can judge how a country is meeting its obligations to fight corruption. If we had tier ratings and took action against those that are unacceptable, it would be a game changer in regards to the global response to corruption, as we've seen the global response to trafficking. Uh, that legislation, Senator Young and I have introduced that legislation. It's been reported by the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, I think that would help us in our tool box to, to preserve democracies. We've got to invest in our foreign assistance and democracy from, uh, building. When you take a look at the foreign assistance budget, it's too small to start off with, but the percentage of that budget that goes to democracy building is just a small, small percentage. We need to do a better job in helping countries develop and protect democratic institutions. Uh, we, we've invested a lot in Central America, not enough. Central America is extremely vulnerable. To these, these are democratic states that are very vulnerable of losing, uh, 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 being effective democracies. So we need to invest in democracy. It's in our national security interests. We, we need to block arms sales to those countries that are using these arms against their own people. Uh, Senator Durbin has joined me in legislation that would do that. America's military technology is what every country in the world wants. Every country. And we should not just make it available because of the country is our NATO ally or our friend, supposedly, if they're using this, this might against uh, basic principles of, of democracy. And we've got to counter the propaganda. We can't be naive about this. When Russia attacked us in 2016, uh, we provided funds in Congress to fight what they were doing in propaganda uh, the administration held those funds up for, for way too long, but there's bipartisan support for us to get in this game to make sure that we get information out there that's accurate because false information is now a tool being used to bring down the democratic institutions. Uh, we have to have disclosure laws on social media to protect our election system. There's legislation pending that would deal with that. Uh, other countries have responded to put guardrails on social media, we need to do the same here in the United States. And we need to support civil societies. America needs to support civil societies in countries around the world. So we had the confirmation hearing for Secretary Sullivan to be ambassador uh, to Russia. The questions many of us asked, including this senator, is whether our embassy, our mission in Moscow will be a beacon of hope for civil societies in Russia. And Secretary Sullivan answered uh, affirmatively uh, and that he would take direct st uh, steps to continue the tradition of our mission in Russia. I think that's extremely important. The stakes could not be higher. That's the way I started. And I, and I appreciate what you're doing today. 
China is using their economic power to try to influence democratic institutions. Russia is using an asymmetric arsenal in order to compromise democratic institutions. I authored a report in January of last year on Russia's asymmetric arsenal, on what they're doing to attack democratic states, pr primarily in Europe, but now also here in the United States. And uh, so th th we got adversaries out there that are trying to bring us down. What Hungary and Turkey and Poland and other countries are doing are playing into Russia's playbook. They're helping Russia accomplish its objective to divide us and bring down democratic institutions. They're weakening NATO. They're weakening the commitments under the Helsinki final accords. This is what's happening, and we have to counter that. The stakes could not be higher. So uh, it's the most important thing we can do, the most important thing we can do, is get our own house in order. Fight here in America for the principles of democracy, honesty, human rights, rule of law, independent judiciary, separation of branches of government, anti-corruption measures, including enforcement of the emolument clause of the Constitution of the United States. America's leadership by our own actions is so critical to preserving and expanding democracy. And that's what I hope will come out of this session today with the expert panelists that you have. I look forward to hearing, the re hearing about their conversation, but also the, the playbook for democracy. Uh, it is a, 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 an incredible contribution to preserving our democratic system here in the United States and America's leadership for democracy around the world. Thank you again for what you're doing. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.